So we know Mookie Betts will be the first second base eligible player drafted in 2024, but who will be next? Let's find out. Welcome into Fantasy Baseball today on Tuesday, October 31st. Ooh, happy Halloween. Frank Sample joined by Scott White. Today on the show, we're going to recap the top 10 second basemen from this past season. Scott's way too early 2024 rankings. What's the latest in the World Series? We'll talk about that in just a little bit. For those watching, you are probably wondering, what the heck is on Frank's face? For those listening, it's not a mask. I'm talk talking perfectly fine. I have a full-on mustache and nothing else. I shaved my beard. <laughs> Scott, I want it to be David Schneider for Halloween. You look like David Schneider. Yes. The, like one, not, once you told me that, I can't unsee it now. Should I put my glasses on and then I'll really look like David Schneider? Oh, man. Yeah. So it's, fitting, it's fitting for the second base preview, though. I will. Uh, I'll go ahead and reveal that David Schneider is not among my top 20 second basemen. How for dare you? 2024. Uh, he is 22nd, but he's not top 20, which I think is encouraging. That's an encouraging first sign here before we really get into it. That second base, you know, not maybe not as bad as you think it is. <laughs> Scott and I were talking beforehand. We basically had polar opposite takes. Scott loves second base and thinks there probably is a lot of upside. I think I can agree with that. But it's every player I thought I was going to be excited about. I just found one glaring wart, and I was like, I don't know. I don't really like that. And and so it kind of pushed me away. But of course, we will talk about all those players. There uh, are always warts. I, we could talk about warts, David Schneider's warts, if you want to. Oh, come on, Scott. Not today. Not when I've got this mustache. Come on, man. Um, are you doing anything for Halloween, Scott? Taking the kids out? Dressing up? Taking the kids out. Yeah. I myself am not dressing up. Oh, come on. It's not really my thing. But, uh, but yeah, taking the kids out for... Probably not for very long, but for long enough, long enough. Did you teach them any life lessons about candy this year? I know that was a, a big, a big sticking point for you last year. Oh yeah. We had our, our, uh, our strategy ses session last year. I'll post that video again. I'm not sure. I'm not sure my older one is, is down to uh, participate in that. He's, he's come, he's become a little bit sullen, you know, he's almost nine, nine going on. 15 or something I, I don't know i don't know what's going on with him kids you know they they have they they their personalities keep changing you can't keep up with it yep i, I wish i could relate scott but i've got like a three-year-old cat so that's probably the, <laughs> the furthest uh i can uh help out with this conversation let's quickly get an update on the world series and then again we'll get into uh the second base recap here game one scott was like one of the coolest games that i've ever seen obviously not if you're an Arizona Diamondbacks fan, but our guy, Corey Seager, clutch ninth inning home run. And then Adolis Garcia would later walk it off with a home run. Game two, dominated by the Diamondbacks offense. And game three just ended as we recorded this. Uh, the Rangers are up. They won the game three to one, so they now have a two to one series lead. But the big story, injuries. Max Scherzer left with back tightness. Adolis Garcia left with left side tightness. And you know, frankly, th those two can have a, a pretty lasting impact here on the World Series. So, I don't know. I just kind of throw my arms up and say, let's see what happens. Yeah, let's see what happens. Uh, so, Rangers up two to one now. They got to go to an. I, I mean, I, I I presume we've seen the last of Adolis Garcia this series. Hopefully not for the Rangers' sake, but you know, they just they have to play five hundred ball without him for the next four games. And uh, I think that's certainly doable though. The diamondbacks have been hard to finish off as both the Dodgers and Phillies can attest. Yep. I have a feeling uh, this series is far from over and we'll hear from the Welsh on tomorrow's podcast. He was actually at game three. So we'll get a feel for what the vibe was like, what his thoughts were, uh, where his head is at. Um, latest on the World Series. We'll we'll do that on tomorrow's podcast. Let's get into our second base recap and take a look at the top uh, 10 or so from this past season. Three of the top 13 overall players in Roto were second base eligible, starting with, no surprise, Mookie Betts, who was the fourth overall player in Roto. He was the fourth highest scoring hitter in head-to-head -head points leagues 
He just turned 31 in early October. And while, you know, you hear that number 31, you think oh, he's, he's kind of getting up there. The dude just arguably had his career season batting 307, 39 home runs, 126 runs scored, 107 RBI, 14 steals. He's set a career high in home runs two years in a row. And Mookie Betts has 117 plus runs scored in five of eight full seasons, Scott. So I know he's, you know, kind of getting up there in age, but I feel like regardless of format, he's probably like a top five to seven pick. No later than that, I think, uh, heading into 2024. Yeah, no, I would agree. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember the last time a second base, I guess it wasn't that long ago, a second base eligible player ranked that high because remember Trey Turner had that one year he was second base eligible. Uh, but prior to that, it's Altuve was kind of a mainstay near the top. No, it was like a top. It, it's probably going back to the prime years of Altuve. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and what's funny about that is I, I don't, I don't know that it's a slam dunk. You would draft bets to start him at second base. We always dreamed of the day he would carry over second base eligibility from one year to the next. It's happening now, but I. I I like so much of what's out there at second base. I see so much upside there uh, from really all the way through the top 20 that I, I don't know. I I, I kind of think you might be better off starting bets in the outfield. Outfield seems weaker than any infield position. As somebody who's now ranked all the hitter hitting positions, I can say that. Um, maybe in a three outfielder league, it would you, you might prefer to start bets at second base because really no second baseman compares to him in terms of upside. Um, and you don't have to go that deep in the outfield in a three outfielder league, of course, but in a five outfielder league, I don't know. I, I, th I think you might be better off sticking with bets in the outfield. I guess the only one knock on Mookie Betts is that he's not going to run as some of as much as the other first round picks even his teammate Freddie Freeman, which sounds crazy to say at this point, <laughs> yeah. uh, just 48th percentile sprint speed for Mookie Betts, but they'll still give you something 12 to 15 steals. But I, I really would not expect more than that at this point for Mookie Betts. The number two second baseman was Marcus Semien, who finished 11th overall in Roto. He was the seventh highest scoring hitter in head to head points leagues. He just turned 33 in September, but a lot like what I said for Mookie Betts, the age doesn't really seem to matter here. Uh, Marcus Semien just hit 276. With 29 homers, 122 runs scored, 100 RBI, 14 steals, and 826 OPS. And over the past three seasons, Semyon has finished as a top 25 overall player each year. He has missed one game, one game during the regular season over the past three years. And he's ninth in home runs, second in runs scored, first in plate appearances. So we know this is a volume play, Scott, and that kind of worries me as players get older because you know eventually you're not going to be a volume play it just kind of works out that way but yeah. I really don't have a reason to believe Marcus Semyon won't be near the top of the plate appearance leaders again in 2024 yeah I mean other than like you said the the age thing which hasn't been an issue so far but it isn't an issue until it's an issue right as we saw from Justin Verlander this year um, who's much older than Simeon, it's worth pointing out. But, you know, 33 is old for for the typical player, and that's that's how old Simeon is. In terms of what, what Simeon does statistically, he's elevated quite a bit by the lineup around him. If he wasn't, if he wasn't like a surefire uh, 200-plus, it was actually 222 this past year, combined runs in RBI then maybe it would be easier. The, the case for downgrading him would be easier. You know, he hit 276 this year, but usually he's more between 250 and 260, so not really really much of a benefit there. You know, 25 homers, 25 steals. I, I'm sorry, 25 homers, 15 steals. Pretty good, but, you know, not, not, not surefire stud numbers and not numbers that would clearly distinguish him at second base. It's it's so much of it is just that run in RBI production that comes from hitting high in the Rangers lineup. Not that I, I necessarily expect that to change next year either, but um, you factor in some of those concerns and uh, 
I'll go ahead and say Marcus Simeon is not my number two second baseman for next year. He's very high, but not number two. Ooh, a little tease there from Scotty. All right, uh, let's move on to number three. That was Ozzy Albies. He was the 13th overall player in Roto. He was the third second baseman in head-to-head -head points. He turns 27 years old in January, so really in the prime of his career right now. Just hit 280 with a career-high 33 home runs, 96 runs, a career-high 109 RBI, 13 steals, and an 849 OPS. You look at Ozzy Albies' last two healthy seasons, 2021 and this past season, he has been a top 16 overall player in each of those years. Uh, does not post big exit velocities, Scott, but just finds a way to mash lefties and and, and kind of pull his way to just hitting the ball right over the fence. And I don't know, it's like two of the past three years, this is what Ozzy Albies has done. So I think when he's healthy, we should probably ex expect something similar. Yeah. I mean, that, that 2022 season where he uh, broke a couple of bones, right? I think it was a thumb and a foot or something. I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was, it was freakish injuries. It wasn't the normal, oh, a pulled quad here and a strained oblique there. The kind of things that you, you worry are going to recur for a player. Um, Albies missed time with a couple broken bones in 2022. And it was a little surprising to me, the, the discount that resulted because of that, given how young he is and given how consistent he had been in fantasy before then. But uh, I don't think he's going to come at a discount next year. And really the skill set between him and Marcus Simeon is, is similar in that, you know, batting average is going to be lower than you expect for a low strike. guy. I mean, Albies did hit 280 this year, but with the high fly ball rate, that usually doesn't happen. Usually he's more like 260. Uh, but good power production, closer to 15 steals than like 20 or 25, and good run in RBI production, batting high in a very good lineup. Uh, Albies did spend uh, most of, I forget when it started exactly, but I, I think it was most of the second half. Albies hit second for the Braves after hitting more like fifth or sixth early in the year. Uh, and I imagine they'll they'll pick up with that arrangement again next year, which will help his fantasy value. Uh, even with the time he spent lower in the order, he still had a combined 215 runs in RBI, so that didn't seem to hold him back at all. Uh, but yeah, batting second is going to be even better for Albies. I remember for a lot of people that were worried about drafting Ozzy Albies, it was, where is he going to bat in the lineup? And you're right, earlier on in the season, uh, Spent 34 games batting sixth, did Ozzy Albies. But then, you know, overall, the, the position he batted most in in the lineup was second, batting second. 78 uh, of his games this past season came batting second. And based on what he just did, I agree with you. I think we should expect him to bat very high in the Braves lineup again in 2024. The number four second baseman was Nico Horner. He finished 25th overall in Roto. He was the fourth second baseman in head to head points. He turns 27 years old next May. So also in the prime of his career, he hit 283 with nine home runs, 98 runs scored, 68 RBI and 43 steals, sixth most in all of baseball. We know Nico Horner makes a ton of contact, just a 12.1% strikeout rate. But this is kind of where we start to get into the warts a little bit, Scott, because yeah. pretty clearly Nico Horner is not going to hit for power. He has just 19 home runs total over the past two seasons probably not going to provide RBI either. So if you're drafting him in a Roto League, he kind of has to fit the right build. He's going to give you batting average. I feel safe saying he's going to give you like 30, 35 plus steals. Probably mm. going to score runs. But a player like that, uh, you know, it, it's not for every team. You probably have to draft him with like a Jordan Alvarez or a Pete Alonso or, or even like a Matt Olson. I, I think it makes sense to do it that way. Yeah, and... I guess this is a good time to kind of talk about my broad take on second base because it does begin here with Nico Horner that while I do see a lot of upside at the position, a lot of intriguing players who I could, who wouldn't be too difficult to get excited about drafting. It's really hard to rank them 
because they do different things. They stand out in different ways. It, it's the one you want the most kind of depends on the team you're building because Horner, I mean, you said it, he finished fourth at the position last year, according to the, to the, um, you know, the Roto formula, but a, a complete non-factor for home runs. And if, if you already have enough stolen bases by the time, by the time we reach the point in the draft where you consider taking him, you're probably going to pass on him. You probably need power more at that point. You know, if you were had one of the top five picks, you got Ronald Acuna or you, Corbin Carroll or somebody like that. You got a nice foundation for stolen bases already. Horner is probably not the second baseman for you. And that's going to eliminate a lot of people on draft day. And so how do you account for that in the rankings? Uh, I, I had a hard time with that, putting together my rankings because you see other second basemen out there who could still make an impact in stolen bases, but without being such a detriment in home runs. And you also pointed out, okay, but stolen bases aren't all that Horner provides. And that's true. He did hit 283 this year. He hit 281 last year. That's not the same as hitting like 315. You know, I mean, it's, he's, he's a, he's helpful in batting average gets lots of at bats and it, and will be a net benefit in that category, clearly. But he's not going to like carry you in batting average either. So is it, how, how much is that really worth? Not nothing, but enough to overcome the home run, the lack of home runs. Uh, I'm a little skeptical of that. I don't see myself investing in Horner much unless I just really get burned with stolen bases early on. And I do have some questions about how good the Cubs lineup is going to be in 2024. Now we're very early in the off season. They could clearly re-sign Cody Bellinger or even bring in another free agent or make some trades, whatever it might be, but they lost Bellinger. They lost Candelario. You know, as of now, it, it, it looks like their offense could take a step back with the Chicago Cubs. So uh, if that happens, then we maybe we're not getting a plus contributor in run scored either. So just something to consider for now. And, and obviously it's, it's still really early in the off season. Our number five second baseman was Ha Sung Kim, who finished 38th overall in Roto. He was the eighth second baseman in head to head points, just turned 28 years old in October, wound up hitting 260 with 17 home runs, 84 runs scored, 38 steals, and a 749 OPS. This is the player that he was, this is the player that closely resembled who he was in the KBO, where he hit 19 plus home runs in all six of his full KBO seasons. He had 21 or more steals in four of those six seasons. So he was a more like power speed contributor there. Uh, maybe it just took him a season to kind of get his footing underneath him, whatever it might be. But we get into the warts, Scott, because Hassan Kim does not hit the ball hard. His average exit velocity was in the seventh percentile. Um, he hit 17 home runs on 18 barrels. That doesn't really add up to me. I mean, normally that should be like, 11, 12 home runs based on, I know there's like a percentage of how many of your barrels should technically turn into home runs, but 17 home runs on 18 barrels doesn't really add up. Uh, and he crushed left-handed pitching. He was like subpar against righties, which, you know, that's, those are most of the pitchers that he's going to be facing. I don't know. I mean, this is all kind of me saying like, uh, I, I don't know how much I actually like Haas on Kim for next year. Uh, yeah, it's it's a tough one. In theory, in theory, he's kind of a less extreme version of Horner. Like I, I feel pretty confident the steals will be there, but how much of those seventeen home runs, like how how much is that going to carry over to next year? Given that the the contact on average is pretty soft, you know, on the high end is pretty soft. He he does have a high pull rate, and that is how you get more power out of weak contact. So he made it work last year but is that something he can repeat over and over again i have my doubts about that for kim too he's just such a handy player though because he is a stolen base standout and because he's eligible at second third and shortstop it's you know it's it's you want to see the glass half full with him but i do think it's dangerous to just pencil him in for another 17 home runs more than horner yes but it, it comes probably with a lower batting average, maybe by as much as 20 or 30 points. The plate discipline is a little bit better too. Like ha Sung Kim does a better job getting on base. So there's a lot to like with that. I mean, there's a chance that he 
is hitting leadoff again next year for the Padres. And if well, that's that's also questionable too. Like, what if he doesn't? Like, I'm I'm more confident Horner will continue to hit first or second than Kim. Yeah, um, I mean, I I think based on their lineup construction, it probably makes sense for him to hit leadoff. I mean, assume assuming he's as good as he was last year, but I mean, this past season. But I think like having a, a two, three, four, five behind him of like Juan Soto, Tatis, Machado, Bogarts, that makes plenty of sense. If they're all still there. If they're all still there, yes. Yeah. Indeed. See what happens with the Padres this offseason as well. Let's take our first break. When we return, we'll get into the rest of our second base recap. We'll do that here on Fantasy Baseball Today. An NWSL semifinal Sunday you'll never forget. With an icon leading the Shield winners against a legend who's hanging up her boots. And a budding star looking for back-to-back championships against a squad determined to give their captain a grand finale. All on CBS Sports Network. Welcome back in. Let's jump back into our second base recap. The number six second baseman this year was Cattell Marte. He finished 42nd overall in Roto. He was the fifth best second baseman in head-to-head points leagues. Just turned 30 in October. And Cattell Marte hit 276 with 25 homers, 94 runs scored, 82 RBI, eight steals, and an 844 OPS. He played 150 games for just the second time in his career. And in the previous three years combined, Cattell Marte missed nearly 30% of his game. So I think the prudent approach would be to, you know, expect at least one IL stint uh, moving forward per season for Cattell Marte. And uh, I, maybe, I don't know if this is fair to say, Scott, because obviously he ranks very highly in Roto, but it just kind of feels like Cattell Marte is better in a points league because of his plate discipline, the high OPS, batting high in the lineup, doesn't really steal all that many bases. It just yeah. feels like he's a better points league player than he is a roto player. Yeah, I mean the lack of steals at this at this position in particular is is going to be hard to is, is going to be a tough pill to swallow because there are so many stolen bases to be found here, and if you don't get them at second base, you got to find ways to get them at other positions, and and so it. it it in some ways it feels a bit like a resignation to take Cattell Marte because of that. Now, like obviously he was, was a really good player in 2023. If you do invest in him, you you can plan on having him in your lineup every week. But we do have to remember he was drafted outside the top 200 overall in 2023 because his 2022 was so disappointing, and his 2021 was good. His 2020, not so good. His 2019, amazing. So he's kind of had this odd year, great, even year, not so great thing going on. I think it would be superstitious to say that because next year is an even numbered year, Cattell Marte won't be good. But I do think it's factual to say he's had trouble sustaining his production from one year to the next. He's been inconsistent. Like, that's just a fact. And so uh, I, I think that's another reason to be a little guarded with... Uh, with how you approach Cattell Marte when he's coming off a good season and you know his his cost is going to be higher because of that. So there have been four drafts over at the NFBC so far this offseason. Cattell Marte's ADP, 147. Does that sound good? That sounds great to me. I mean, that, <laughs> I, I that's, you know, I we were saying... I don't remember exactly where he's be, being drafted last year, but outside the top 200. Let's say it was exactly 200. Um, coming off a year where he hit 240 with 12 home runs. That seemed like an overreaction. Like we, he was being downgraded too much. So 50 spots higher when he hits 276 with 25 home runs. I mean, that still sounds like, that still sounds like a good value to me. I don't know. Um, I have done, I've done most of my position by position rankings at this point. Haven't gotten into the, you know, mixing them up as a top 300 or whatever. So we'll see where Cattell Marte ends up for me, but I imagine it's going to be higher than that. Yeah. And, uh, but it is only four drafts as you point out. Yeah. It's, I, I think there's going to be a lot that, that changes obviously from now until, you know, once we get to February and, um, and March and, and all those big draft months. I mean, the fact he's now set a record for longest postseason hitting streak. I don't know what, how much that moves him up in the rankings, you know, it, it shouldn't, but, 
uh, he, you know, he's obviously been one of the standouts of the postseason. Yeah. Yeah. He's looked great in the playoffs as well as Cattell Marte. And I, I, we, I've teased this a few times already and, and we'll talk about it more on tomorrow's podcast with the Welsh, but I'm actually headed out to Arizona this week for first pitch Arizona, which is put together by baseball HQ. It's this fantasy baseball conference and it's, it's going to be all, it was awesome last year. It's going to be even better because obviously the world series is going on in Arizona, but we're going to get, get out to some AFL games. We're going to do a live podcast, more details to come on that. Uh, and I'm going to do a draft. I'm going to do my first like off season, you know, like draft and hold. And, and so I'm going to have more of an idea uh, when I come back. And I, I think we'll probably recap that draft, you know, once I'm back from Arizona, but um, yeah, I'll have a little bit more of an idea of, of the player pool and, and, and where players are going after I uh, do that draft. The number seven second baseman from this past season was Bryson Stott. He finished 44th overall in Roto, ninth second baseman in head-to-head points leagues, just turned 26 years old in October, wound up hitting 280 with 15 home runs, 78 runs scored, 62 RBI, and 31 steals. He makes a lot of contact. He actually uh, dropped his K rate from his rookie season, uh, dropped it down to 15.6% this year, increased his line drive rate, Kind of feels like a maybe like a poor man's Nico Horner, but he's going to give you more pop. So I don't know. Maybe poor man isn't the right word. He's, I, I, I like describe a, he's like a jacked up Nico Horner, I guess. I describe Bryson Stott as the happy medium between Nico Horner and Hassan Kim. Okay. Because he'll come closer to Horner's batting average, he'll come closer to Kim's power production. And, and, and there's a fact Stott is the better power producer than Kim next year for the reasons we highlighted earlier. Um, he won't, he probably won't run quite as much as either of those two, but he'll run enough. He was actually uh, higher in, in sprint speed than both those guys, Hassan Kim and Nico Horner for what yeah, it's for whatever it's worth. And yeah. I don't, I don't know. It's not, it's not worth nothing, but I don't know that it's worth a lot. I mean, players run how much they run regardless of how fast they are. I feel like, uh, but you know, Stott, depending how much later he goes than those two, he might be the one to have, in my mind. I think the only issue for Bryson Stott right now is where does he bat in the lineup because he yeah. played uh, 57 games batting fifth, 35 games batting sixth, 39 at leadoff. And my guess those were, I don't know, maybe games where they were experimenting with Schwarber somewhere else or giving him a day off or maybe they were playing a tough lefty or something because oddly enough, um, Bryson Stott was actually really good against lefties this year. His, his splits overall, lefty, right, home road, are, are really, really good. So I just don't, I don't, you think it's realistic, Scott? Can can Bryson Stott actually move up in the Phillies lineup? I, I just don't see how it happens. Yeah. I mean, with the personnel they have, it seems unlikely, barring an injury. And, you know, anybody could get injured, obviously, but you got to figure Harper and Trey Turner are fixed to two of those top three spots. I could see Schwarber moving down just because it's so such an oddity to have your leadoff hitter batting 199 or whatever. Makes up for it with a high walk rate, I understand, but yep. um, but it it, it it wouldn't be a stretch to see him surpassed an on base level and um, and move down the lineup as a result, which may move Stott up. But uh, I would bet against it. I think he's probably going to keep batting. Where did he hit mostly? Fifth, sixth? Yeah, so it was 57 games batting fifth, 35 batting sixth. Yeah. I'm going to guess that continues for the most part. Yeah. But I, if the if this Phillies lineup can kind of reach their potential, kind of like we saw in the postseason, then maybe everyone just puts up massive, you know, run totals and RBI totals, kind of like not to the same level. I'm not saying they're going to have a historic season, but like everyone in the Atlanta Braves lineup was really good and so I don't know. Maybe the Phillies can just kind of get it going and, and, and everyone puts up awesome numbers in 2024. The number eight second baseman this past season was Max Muncy, but he will not have second base eligibility in 2024. So we're going to save him for our third base recap. The number nine second baseman was Glaber Torres, who finished 47th overall in Roto. He was the sixth best second baseman in head to head points leagues. And he turns 27 in December, which sounds crazy because he's been around for so long and it's just been a an interesting career for Glaber Torres came up when he was so young got off to this great start 
kind of had like some of those COVID shortened seasons and, and he was like banged up from that for a while. And he was just, I don't know. He w wasn't the same player. And now the past two years, Glaber Torres is back on track this year. He hit 273 with 25 homers, 90 runs scored, 13 steals and 800 OPS huge strides in plate discipline. He had a 10% walk rate to go along with a 14.6% strikeout rate. Uh, that was 22.6% in 2022. I mean, this was far and away the lowest strikeout rate we've ever seen from Glaber Torres. And it's it's supported by his swinging strike rate. He, had a, he posted his career best zone contact rate. The question now is, will Glaber Torres be able to maintain those those gains, those improvements from this past season. I, I don't know that we could say that for certain, Scott, but uh, I, I I could argue that this was the best all-around version we've seen yet from Glaber Torres. Yeah, he was solid. Um, best all-around version. I mean, it, it would be it would be hard to put this season over the 38 homer season he had as a 2019-year-old. I understand he ran a little less in those days than he does now but there's a big difference between 38 homers and, and 25 homers worth noting. The 38 homers came in 2019 when everybody was setting a career high in home runs, but still, but still is it is worth noting that I don't think, I don't think Torres should be held in the same regard now that he was then when it looked like, Oh, he might be the number one second baseman for years to come. I think he, you know, we, we've, we've talked about a lot of second basemen, who do a variety of things, um, but have their warts, as you mentioned, have their concerns. I think if you're looking to avoid warts from a second baseman, you're going to gravitate toward a Glaber Torres, who seems relatively safe, like you have a pretty good idea what he's going to provide for you. But to me, he doesn't have quite the upside of most of the players we've talked about here. Doesn't, doesn't, contribute the big steals he's not a zero for steals but he doesn't contribute the big steals total his home runs are maybe better than like a ha sung kim or a bryson stott but i don't think it's enough to make up for the steals disparity in uh in uh five by five scoring but even point scoring where you'd think torres would see more of a benefit from that improved plate discipline you were referring to even in point scoring you look at points per game it bears out so that he's more a, a more like a tier behind those guys than uh, than being in the same tier. Yeah, that that's all fair, and you're absolutely right. I definitely jumped the gun because yeah, that I'm looking at that 2019 season. Yeah, 2019. Yeah, 2019. Yeah, that was that was still a pretty awesome all around season, and it was probably better than uh, this past year for Glaber Torres. But oh, oh, we should also we should also mention for Torres. Uh, there's a lot of chatter that he could be traded. Yep. As a Yankees fan, I'm sure you hear that, Frank. For his career, he has 123 home runs. Let me see if I have that right. Yeah, 123 home runs. 73 have come at home, 50 on the road. Yeah. So that might hurt if he gets traded. I don't I don't know that we want to see that for Glaber Torres. Yeah, looking at it a little bit closer at home in his career, batting 271 with an 816 OPS on the road. Glaber Torres batting 263, 761 OPS. So you don't really see it as much in the, the batting average in the OPS, but the slugging, 480 at home, 428 on the road. So it would have to, obviously it depends where Glaber Torres winds up, but I, I think I agree. Like maybe if he gets traded to, I don't know. He's been rumored to like the Marlins the past couple of years. Obviously that would be maybe the worst case scenario, but yeah, you'd probably project for like 20 home runs instead of the 25 that he's hit, you know, the past couple of years. Yeah. I mean, I'd have to look into it more. Uh, well, you know, there's expected home runs by ballpark. Let's, let's, let's take a little peek at that right now. So he hit 25 home runs. Cincinnati would be 31. Cincinnati is always the highest. Uh, you know, it goes to a place like Baltimore. I don't know why he would, but it's 19 home runs. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think maybe um, kind of a worst case scenario for Glaber Torres. You're you're penciling him in for something like 20 home runs. So not terrible, but it would it would have an impact on his draft day value. I would say. Hey, you know, I'm looking at some of the ballparks now. A lot of them are still like mid to upper 20s. 
in home runs. Yeah, Houston uh Angels, which is have a hitter's park. Yeah. Like even um, Seattle, Texas. Yeah. Atlanta. I mean, he's not going to those locations, but all right. I mean, we'll see. Again, it depends. Well, it's just worth mentioning that Glaber Torres has been mentioned in, in trade rumors the past couple of years. The number 10 and 11 second baseman this year were Spencer Steer and Justin Turner. We talked about both of those names on the first base recap. So I do want to quickly talk about uh, number 12. That was well, Luis. Steer's, Steer's not eligible at second base. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I'm skipping past okay. uh, Steer and Justin Turner. Turner yeah. won't have second base eligibility next year either. Right. Uh, number 12 was Luis Arise, who finished 71st overall in Roto, ninth best second baseman in head-to-head points leagues. He turns 27 in April, wound up hitting 354, which obviously is amazing. And then what? He hit 10 home runs, 71 runs, 69 RBI, three steals, in 861 OPS. And I think he's kind of a divisive player for like maybe the average fantasy player versus like, I guess the more hardcore fantasy player, because there were times this year, Scott, where people would tweet at us or email in and say, Luis, Luis Arise is batting 400. Why do you have him so low in the rankings? Well, yeah, that batting average is really good. And then what? That's always the case with Luis Arise. And I, mm-hmm. I think the the more conservative approach is to expect him to hit like 325 next year instead of 354. And, and so that's well, obviously not going to help either. That's, that's it. Um, so you were talking about people complaining we didn't have him higher when he was batting 400. He didn't bat 400. He batted nope. 354, you know? So rest of season rankings, we're obviously not anticipating him continuing to hit 400, and he didn't. Um, and, and then when you're talking about projecting him for next year, even 354 is a really difficult projection to make for any player. I mean, we haven't seen we haven't seen a player consistently hit not even consistently, but hit 350 multiple times since like Ichiro Suzuki and his prime. It's an exceedingly rare thing that very few players in history, certainly in modern history, are capable of of doing more than, you know, one time as kind of a fluky season where everything went right. Luis Arias is built for batting average. I'm not trying to denigrate the guy, but 354 is math on a mathematical level is just really hard to sustain, which is why you don't see it very often. Um, you know, you, you said 325, 315 is is kind of what I'm thinking. You, you look at his career numbers prior to last year. He's going to be a help in batting average. But if it's not that outlier rate where he's far and away better than every other hitter, then... You know the lack of the lack of home runs, the lack of stolen bases. It's it's really going to hold him back. Even with that three fifty four mark, he was barely top ten at second base, right? As a three fifty four hitter, and and that's not even factoring in some of the guys who came up later in the year who we haven't talked about yet, like Matt McClain and Zach Geloff, who I'm I'm think everybody will have ranked ahead of a rise next year. Yeah, so that's what makes it. A little bit tough to talk about because he he's an awesome real life player and he's what he does at times. I mean, like the multiple four or I think he didn't he have like multiple five hit games this year. Like that stuff is just awesome from a baseball perspective, but it doesn't translate as much from a fantasy perspective. So just I guess keep those things in mind when thinking about drafting Luis Arise in 2024. Let's quickly hit on some news and notes before we uh, get into your way too early 2024 second base rankings and uh the latest here not too much going on again we're kind of in this weird phase once the world series ends we'll kind of get into like hot stove and 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 rumors and uh winter meetings and all that fun stuff but the latest brandon woodruff who we've heard a lot about recently uh underwent shoulder capsule surgery he hopes to resume throwing next summer and uh return prior to the end of 2024 so we've kind of heard this all over the place apparently you know they thought he was going to be ready earlier in the season. Then they said he's out for the year. Now he's saying he's hoping to pitch sometime towards the end of, of 2024. So uh, it we'll ain't see. happening. We'll see what happens with uh Brandon Woodruff. Um, and there is a chance that the Brewers non tender him. I, I read that recently. And um, was his last year of control? Yeah, it's, it's a contract year. So if he's okay. not going to pitch, I don't know that it makes sense for them to keep him around. 
Um, well, so we'll see. not not with what he'd earn in arbitration. Yeah, which I think uh, is at least eleven million dollars based on what I read. But so. they could do, you know, they could do some, what they could sign him to like a two year deal. Yeah, or something like that. Um, while he recovers, yeah, no, that's going to be an interesting decision for them. Alex Cobb will undergo surgery on his left hip labrum on Tuesday and will miss six months. So that means the earliest Alex Cobb can be ready is late May. Not to mention he'll need, obviously, a minor league rehab stint. My guess is June is the earliest we should expect to see Alex Cobb next year. Phillies president Dave Dombrowski told reporters that he hopes to re-sign free agent Aaron Nola. I'm sure he would love to. We'll see what the, the price tag comes in at him. I'm sure many teams would love to sign Aaron Nola. Taylor Walls underwent hip surgery and is expected to return to baseball activities in February. Your Atlanta Braves signed Pierce Johnson to a two-year, $14.25 million extension. Phillies manager Rob Thompson told reporters that Brandon Marsh has a better chance than Johan Rojas to be an everyday player in 2024. Uh, Brandon Marsh actually wound up hitting 277. It was pretty good batting average, and he was better against lefties this year than he had been previously. Uh, Rojas, amazing defender, but offensively, eh. Still uh, leaves a lot to be desired. Aaron Judge won the 2023 Roberto Clemente Award, which is given to an MLB player who, quote, best exemplifies the game of baseball, sportsmanship, community involvement, and the individual's contribution to his team. Last but not least, more so, I guess, actual baseball news, but Craig Council met with the Cleveland Guardians on Monday after previously interviewing with the New York Mets. So uh, perhaps those are the two top teams. Uh, getting ready to to bid on Craig Council here uh, entering the offseason. Let's take our final break. When we return, those way too early rankings here on Fantasy Baseball Today. We need the sports news anywhere. We've got breaking news to bring you. Then get your sports anytime you want them. Big trade news overnight to discuss. Because we know you need sports all the time. A lot of movement in the rankings this week. A legend adds to their legacy. We're bringing you that breaking news right here on HQ. CBS Sports HQ, anywhere, anytime, all the time. Welcome back in and let's dive in. Way too early, 2024 second base rankings. And the top five includes... No surprise, Mookie Betts, but who is number two? We teased it at the top. Scott said it's not Marcus Semien, which means it is Jose Altuve, number two second baseman, followed by Ozzy Albies, Marcus Semien, and Matt McClain. Scott, let's just quickly talk about Jose Altuve. And really now for two years, whenever he's on the field, he has been awesome. Uh, you look at this year, he averaged 3.9 fantasy points per game. That would have tied for seventh among all hitters with Jordan Alvarez. So obviously he's still an amazing hitter. He had 17 home runs, 14 steals, uh, hit 311 with a 915 OPS, did Jose Altuve. That is a 28 home run, 23 steal pace, over 150 games. Now, he hasn't played 150 games since 2017. My guess is you should probably expect like at least one IL stint, but man, when he's on the field, Altuve still performs like a, Dare I say, like a borderline first round pick? Yeah, no, I mean he's he's been one of the best values in fantasy each of the last uh, two or three years. And remember, this year he suffered in the World Baseball Classic that uh, that fractured thumb, and so that dropped him far down the rankings. And he ended up having uh more than a half season, 90 games, more than a half season where he basically performed like a first rounder. So everybody who invested in him, I think was pretty happy with what they got. He is getting older. Uh, he's going to be 34 next May. And as you mentioned, hasn't has missed some time with injuries in recent years, but you know, you, you were, you were using 150 games as the cutoff. He played more than 140 games in each of 2022 and 2021. And apart from that broken thumb, which was, of course, a freak injury, um, he was pretty healthy last year. Did have, uh, did miss uh, some time right around the All-Star break with an oblique injury, but it didn't cost him that many actual games. And, um, you know, came back and kept doing his thing. So I think, I think Altuve is a slam dunk to be the second player drafted at this position. And uh, I'm... I'm going to have a hard time passing him up late in round two, unless well, I was about to say, unless Mookie Betts was my round one pick, but 
you could just shift bets to the outfield, which I was suggesting anyway. It's not often that you actively want to target a, a soon to be 34 year old second baseman in the second round of fantasy drafts, but yeah, I agree, man. Like he, he just feels so safe. He's hit over 300, actually 300 or better each of the past two seasons, power speed, one of the best lineups in baseball. I mean, there's nothing there. There's nothing even in the profile that suggests that he's falling off either. So uh, yeah, yeah. I, I still think Altuve is one of the safest players at the position. Number five. In your oh, life. I, I do want to mention real quick. I do have Albies over Simeon and we talked about it a little already. I, I think their skill sets are very similar, Yeah, but Albies is still in his twenties and Simeon's approaching his mid thirties. And the Braves lineup is better than Texas. Yeah, they're both good. They're both helped by the lineup, but yeah, Braves, I would say is better. So, yeah. Your number five second baseman, and, and one I think many people will be excited about, is Matt McClain. He averaged 3.4 fantasy points per game, which was tied for fifth among second basemen. He doesn't turn 25 until next August. So, you know, he's young. He's kind of entering his prime with the rest of these Cincinnati Reds. He hit 290 with 16 home runs, 14 steals, and an 864 OPS. That's a 26 home run, 23 steal pace, over 150 games. The one knock, Scott, is the strikeout rate, 28.5%. That's pretty high, and it's a weird profile. We were talking beforehand. He strikes out a lot, but he also hits a lot of line drives, which can help with BABIP and batting average. So it's kind of an interesting profile here for Matt McLean. Uh, crushes lefties, was great in Cincinnati in, in their home ballpark, which I, I think will con uh, continue here next season. Uh, what's your take on, on like the skill set and, and and that strikeout rate potentially being an issue? Well, my take is there's a lot of upside here for Matt McClain. He has power and speed, basically an equal measure. And he's aided by his ballpark, the most Homer friendly ballpark. Uh, it could be a great lineup next year with as many hitters as, as they broke in this past year. Uh, ranking him fifth behind the very, like, clearly the, that top four is is its own tier. Betts, Altuve, Albies, Simeon. Like, those are the early round second baseman. And everyone else, you know, is an, it, it, the, what comes after is the tier below. It's a very big tier, I think. It goes about seven players deep. This is where, you know, beginning with McLean here, this is the portion of the second base rankings where I, I had a really hard time sorting out who belongs where. But to me, McLean is the ultimate upside play of that group. Yes, the strikeout rate is concerning, and it actually got worse the longer he was up. You mentioned it was 28% overall. Um, I think it was closer to, I think it was over 30% his last couple months. I'd have to confirm that. Well, I, I guess he wasn't up enough for it to be the last couple months. Uh, let me see if I can find it real quick. So in August, before he got hurt, it was 31%. How much of August did he actually play? Most of August, yeah. So it, it actually got worse the longer McLean was up rather than getting better. Uh, but in spite of that, he hit 290. And I think, I think you can expect him... You know, having been ex having the exposure he has to the league now, you, know, you could expect that strikeout rate to start to drop a little. Even if it doesn't, he's probably going to do enough in terms of power and speed that he'll be pretty happy with what he offers. Maybe he won't hit 290 again, but as a 260 hitter, I still think Matt McLean's very likely to live up to this ranking. Yeah, I think that's probably a more fair expectation because if you look at what Matt McLean did in May. He only played 14 games, but he had 361 in that first month. He had a 500 BABIP, which clearly is um, not sustainable. But June, he hit 287. July, he hit 277. August, he hit 263. So, yeah, I think like, you know, 260 to 270, that's probably yeah. what you should expect. I mean, if you just look at expected batting average yeah. on Stack, has 255, yeah. which is not far below what we're saying. And if he does lower the strikeout rate, there is upside for him to maybe, you know, get to 280 or higher, uh, obviously right. hitting in that ballpark and it's, hitting as many line drives as he does. I mean, it's not it's not a stretch to think he could be a 30-30 guy. I think 25-25 is the safer expectation, but you, if you're a 30-30 second baseman, you almost don't care about the batting average at that point. 90th percentile sprint speed, too, so the dude is definitely fast enough to make it happen. 
Um, yeah. I think the Reds are going to be really willing to run next year, too, just given their personnel. McLean, Ellie De La Cruz, Noel V. Marte. Uh, yeah, you talked me into it, Scott. <laughs> I'm back in on Matt McLean. <laughs> uh, six through 10 in your early second base ranks, you've got Nico Horner, Hassan Kim, Cattell Marte. We spoke about those three earlier. And then we get Zach Geloff at number nine and Bryson Stott, who you have ranked 10th. So yep. Zach Geloff, uh, he just turned 24 in October, like McLean kind of entering this prime right now, 3.2 fantasy points per game. Uh, it's obviously a great mark. He was a second round pick in 2021. He has that prospect pedigree with the A's. He played 69 games. Zach Geloff hit 267 with 14 homers, 14 steals and an 840 OPS. He did that after batting 304 with 12 homers, 20 steals at triple a last season. So you combine everything. You're looking at 26 home runs, 34 steals between the minors and the majors for Zach Geloff. And he's, he's kind of like eerily similar to Matt McClain. He's got a high strikeout rate, 27% elite line drives, 25 and a half percent line drive rate. But man, that plate discipline, you dig a little bit deeper, 16% swinging strike rate, 74.7% zone contact. League average is like 84, 85%. So yeah, it's really 10, low. He's 10 percentage points below that. I mean, that is scary, scary stuff here. So um, there's definitely some some skills. There's power. There's speed. But the strikeouts could turn out to be a really, really huge issue for uh, Zach Eloff. Yeah. And and I kept making a stink about that during the season. I kept insisting. I had, Zach I had, the, blind, I had the blinders on, Scott. I was like, no, I love Zach Eloff. <laughs> yeah, he's somebody I could actually pick up now. So. No, I kept making a stink about that during the season and expecting him to drop off, and it, it didn't really happen. You know, he played 69 games. It didn't really happen. Doesn't mean it won't happen, but, you know, maybe it'll be even less of an issue next year. Maybe he'll get those rates up in his second season, like I was saying about McLean. I don't know. I, I do see that those two is very similar. Obviously, uh, McLean is helped by his lineup and especially his ballpark while Geloff is hindered by them. I think that's the biggest difference between the two, but I don't think they need to be that far apart in rankings. So I have McLean fifth. I have Geloff ninth who I invest in more might depend on where they are actually going on draft day. Uh, but I think, I think if you miss out on McLean and you just want the ult, you, you want upside more than anything else, Geloff is going to be a pretty good choice for you. I'll also say, so you went, you, you listed my six through 10 here. So it's five through 11, 11 being Glaber Torres, five through 11. That's the range here where I just, you could, you could rank them in basically any order. And I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't gripe about it too much because it, it really just depends what you're looking for, what you need. They're so close. The names are Matt McLean at five, Nico Horner at six, Hassan Kim at seven, Cattell Marte at eight, Zach Geloff at nine, Bryson Stott at 10 and Glaber Torres at 11. Uh, again, like Torres seems like the safe one of those. If that's, if that's what you're looking for most, maybe you move them up higher than 11, maybe you move them up to like six or seven. Uh, if you need steals more than anything, you maybe you focus more on Horner and Kim than somebody like Cattell Marte or, or uh, Zach Geloff, you know? So it just, it just kind of depends what you're looking for there. If you want the upside, McLean or Geloff seems like the way to go. But they're all they all should be they're all similar in my mind, even though, you know, the fact I have Matt McLean five and Bryson Stott ten makes it seem like a big difference. It's not as big of a difference as it seems. Again, only four drafts done over at the NFBC so far this offseason. Matt McLean's ADP 69.3. Zach Geloff. 134. It's a big difference. That is a pretty big that difference. Makes me want Geloff. <laughs> Scotty's in. He, potentially. We'll see what happens. Uh, 11 through 15 in the second base rank. Scott already mentioned Gleber Torres at 11, followed by Andres Jimenez, Nolan Gorman, Luis Arise, and Jonathan Aranda. Speaking of Ward, Scott, <laughs> there's a lot of players in this group. Uh, wait, 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 wait. What was that last name you said? Jonathan. What did I say? Jonathan India. You said Can Jonathan Aranda. Yeah, <laughs> I maybe, like Aranda, but not that much. Yeah, maybe I maybe I just yeah that was kind of like a Freudy uh, a Scott Whiteian slip right there with uh, <laughs> Jonathan Aranda, uh, but it's India India at fifteen. 
Um, yeah. A few names here that we haven't talked about, you know, Andres Jimenez, he just turned 25 in September. He's in the prime of his career. Uh, a weird season. Quality of contact went way down, but he did save his season from July 1st on. Jimenez had 261 with 10 homers, 22 steals. So pretty big contributor here in the second half. I, I, I see no reason why he can't steal 30 bases, 30 plus bases mm-hmm. in a 2020. Yeah, he got to 30 with the, the 22 coming in the last three months. I, I read that as Andres Jimenez figured out how to take advantage of the new rules that so much of the league was taking advantage of and just began running wild over the last three months, which kind of salvaged a season, as you say. He's among the fastest players in the league, 93rd percentile mm-hmm. in sprint speed. So, again, it's that's why I, I probably would expect it again next year. Uh, 13th, Nolan Gorman, um, you know, put it together. He had 27 home runs. Over 119 games, he only hit 236. This is very much so like a a Max Muncy type profile. Maybe he's not hitting, you know, sub- not walking as much as Muncy, yeah. but for 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 uh, for roto purposes, yeah, yeah. So I, you know, you're gonna get a lower batting average, but we're talking elite level power. His 16 and a half percent barrel rate that was 97th percentile among all batters, not just second baseman. So Nolan Gorman's power does look legit. Jonathan India, probably one of the hard, hardest players to rank right now. He, he turns 27 this offseason in December. There's, you know, there were rumors that the Reds could look to trade Jonathan India. Obviously, they have all these young kids that are coming up right now. He hit 244 with 17 home runs, 14 steals, got off to a great start. And then as they started to call some of these kids up, they dropped Jonathan India in the lineup. He was batting uh, third uh, more often than not. And I think he started trying to like sell out for power and maybe you know, be a more middle of the lineup type hitter. And I, I think it just kind of messed up his season and, and then he got hurt. So yeah. I don't know. I think he's kind of a hard one to rank. And if he gets traded out of Cincinnati, that's not going to help either. Um, India and Glaber Torres are the two to keep an eye on, two second basemen to keep an eye on as far as trade scenarios go. Uh, I, I see this group here beginning at 12 with Andres Jimenez. I, I see it as, as another tier, but they all kind of similar to the previous tier. They all do different things for you. So Andres Jimenez is the steel specialist. He's, and there's a chance he delivers like a, a poor man, Hassan Kim next year. Uh, Nolan Gorman's the power specialist. Luis Arise, obviously the batting average specialist. And then Jonathan India is kind of the, the um, Jack of all trades, master of none. If you're just trying to get a little of everything, maybe India is the one you go for instead. So, Again, with this group of second basemen, Jimenez, Gorman, Arise, and India, it kind of, rather than being like distinct rankings, it's going to kind of depend what you need most at that stage of the draft. And I'll say this about India. He hit 269 as a rookie in 2021. His XBA that year was 254. His career batting average is 255. So I think expecting something closer to 250 is probably... A uh, fair projection at this point for Jonathan India. 16 through 20 in the second base ranks, we see Tommy Edmond, Brandon Lau, Ronnie Mauricio, Tyro Estrada, and Edward Julian. Again, very different players that we have here. Uh, Tommy Edmond's 2023 wasn't all dissimilar from his 2022. The problem for him is that there's just more players who kind of provide a similar skill set to him than there yeah. have been in, in years past. So he just kind mm-hmm. of falls by the wayside, I guess. Brandon Lau has legitimate power, but he has missed 150 games over the past two years, uh, constantly dealing with back injuries. Ronnie Mauricio, um, exciting prospect with the Mets. He got called up late. He had two homers, seven steals in 26 games. Power and speed there. Uh, Max exit velocity was amazing, but uh, potentially some issues with strikeouts with him. Tyro Estrada, I I think is kind of like a, a diamond in the rough. Like I don't know. I want to see who the Giants manager is and, and you know how, how confident they are in, in Tyro Estrada, but like 14 homers, 23 steals and 120 games. Like he's been a really useful player two years in a row. Uh, Edward Julian is someone we liked. And uh, when he got called up, he kind of lived up to it. He had 263, 16 home runs, 60 runs scored and 839 OPS. Just such an interesting profile, Scott. Uh, amazing walk rate for Julian. He's got a great eye at the plate. But a 31% strikeout rate, uh, 50% ground balls, and he's terrible against lefties. Mm-hmm. Just kind of a 
an interesting profile for fantasy purposes. Yeah, Julian's a weird one. I, I love how much he walks and he lived up to it right away. And the twins bat him, hit, hit him lead off against righties when he whenever he was up because they like that on base rate too. And he has enough natural power, but he puts the ball on the ground a lot, as you mentioned. And when he does put the ball in the air, it's often to the opposite field. He's very opposite field minded. So it's kind of impressive. He hit as many home runs as he did considering. And he, has, he hit a 13% barrel rate. Like, that's a really, really good mark. Not just for a second yeah. baseman. That's just impressive. It kind of makes me wonder what the upside is though, unless that hitting profile changes. I I'm, I'm ranking him this high 20 and we're talking 20th, which, you know, um, is pretty pretty far down the second base rankings. If if you don't play in a league that uses a middle infield spot, you're never going to get to 20 in the second base rankings. But I rank them this high, quote unquote, because I I like the upside of Julian. I'm just not confident he's ever going to actualize it given his shortcomings. We'll see. Uh, you mentioned Estrada at 19, just ahead of Julian. Yeah, I mean he's he's solid. He's kind of a Tommy Edmund light. He's going to provide double digit home runs probably. Won't quite get to Edmund steals, but it'll come close enough. I think I think it's a problem if you draft Estrada as your second baseman, but I think he's somebody you're going to be happy to have as a middle infield option in a roto league. Um yeah, Edmund, we pretty much know what we're getting there. You're exactly right that he's probably the same as he's always been, but when he's one of the few guys out there who can give you 30 steals, you're willing to pay up a lot more than when he's just, you know, now he's just another 30 steal guy who doesn't provide much power. And it's, it's far less attractive in this environment. I think the ultimate um, boomer bust play at second base is Ronnie Mauricio because the skills are so loud. The, the tools are so loud, how hard he hits the ball. And the fact that he ran a ton. Now, he wasn't up for long. He stole seven bases, seven for seven and stolen bases. And the fact he was that aggressive on the base paths, I think you can count on that being a part of Mauricio's contributions in the majors. And it gives him a much higher floor than uh, I worried he might have. If he's going to run that much. I mean, that's great. So the power is almost like uh, gravy at that point. And it seems like he has a lot of it. So, um, in deeper leagues, I think I'm going to have a lot of Ronnie Mauricio. But, you know, obviously still a lot to sort out there. I prefer him to Julian, clearly. clearly, But maybe by even more than the two-spot separation in my rankings would indicate. All right, there you have it. The top 20 second baseman heading into 2024. And for those who have stuck with us this late into the podcast, especially if you're watching us on YouTube, I will actually reveal what I dressed up for as Halloween. Uh, I know today is technically Halloween. My parents have a big Halloween party every year, Scott. Uh, mm. And so my wife and I, we dressed up. You see this mustache. You're thinking, well, what was Frank? I was a character who has integrity. I don't know if you're a South Park fan, Scott, but I dressed up as Randy Marsh and my wife was Towley. And then right. if, if you're watching us on YouTube, I threw up a little image there for, for everyone to, to check it out. Uh, but yeah, I've... You got the you got the color of the shirt down. Yeah, I just ordered one on Amazon. I just was like, I held up a picture of him. I compared it to a shirt on Amazon. I was like, what right. color did they call that on Amazon? I think I just searched teal. Teal. And, okay, yeah, that's what came up. All right. So there you go. Uh, shout out to South Park. If you uh, do have Paramount Plus, is kind of a cheap plug here. There is a new South Park special, so I would recommend checking that out. We're going to wrap there for Scott. I am Frank. Thanks, as always, for tuning in to Fantasy Baseball today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify, and we'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye.